nowadays when you look at a shelf, there are so many brands to look at. And I think our focus on making sure that our story and our mission was behind literally every single can is what helped us find those people and find those people who care. Hey guys, we're here with Signe Cooper, co-founder of Hio, a brand that we love and are huge fans of here at 626. Just shot a, an episode on the podcast with her. Super excited for you guys to check it out. Like and subscribe and follow them on all their social medias. Today we are joined by a very special guest, Signe Cooper, based out of West LA. Signe is a creative director and brand strategist with a background in fine arts and design. Her portfolio of projects and partnerships includes work with brands like Miss Universe, UFC, New York Fashion Week, and Endeavor. Today, she's joining us as co-founder and chief brand officer of Hio, a craft beverage company with an interest in health. Signe, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, of course. Nice. Thanks for coming. I'd love if you could kind of just start and tell us like, what is Hio and how did you even become a part of founding the company? So Hio is what we call a functional social tonic, um, but understand that that is a lot of un unfamiliar words to a lot of people. So in like layman's terms, it is a sparkling seltzer um, with functional ingredients uh, that basically are in there to better your body and mind at the same time as better the drinking experience. So what we're positioned as in the market and kind of what we're trying to do is change how people drink and how they inter interact with alcohol in the social occasion. What we saw and how kind of we started, um, myself and my two co-founders, Evan and George, are close friends from college. Um, I actually met Evan in the dorms. And <laughs> for George, um, he n lived at the time with my now fiance. So we've been in the fam for a while, been super close friends. Um, and in college, we're all doing separate things. Evan was focused in business. I was in art school. So we all kind of just had these different paths that we followed after college. I went into design and some PR work like immediately after and then worked at Endeavor. Evan was working for a um, real estate like financial services firm called Guggenheim Partners and George was at Red Bull in music marketing and like event marketing. So we were all doing totally different things. In April of 2019, right before the pandemic started, Evan and George, who were roommates, you know, all throughout college and very close, had always kicked around the idea of starting a company together, starting a brand, but didn't know what it was or really know what they wanted to focus on straight after school. And so in April of 2019, um, they actually both had a shared experience with their families with alcohol and separately had family members that were hospitalized in the same month of the same year. So as best friends, like in their mid 20s, around alcohol all the time, all of a sudden, you know, basically having their worlds flipped upside down um, with people that were close to them, you know, struggling with the substance. And so out of solidarity, both went sober for a period of time. And when they were sober, it was like we were 25, 26, you know, in L.A., coming out of USC, you know, with friends here, trying to have careers, have social lives, make relationships. And we noticed that like every occasion to socialize was around drinking. And it was like the older that we got, the less enjoyable that becomes. So they noticed this white space and they started going out and they were sober and they were like, what the hell? Why am I only ordering, you know, club soda? Why am I only getting offered, you know, like energy drinks when yeah. I want something that's actually enjoyable and something that's like as much effort and thought as a cocktail? So they started kind of kicking around ideas. Um, I came in before it was like, <laughs> they were very early on and this isn't even usually part of our like high -o inception story, but like the true first way I got involved was they originally had an idea for like a hangover drink very early on. I think this might have been pre the alcohol incident, but I had designed a logo for them at one point. I was like working in creative at Endeavor and I was just like one of their friends that they knew who could make a logo. And so they had been thinking about this beverage idea, but at the time, yeah, it was a coconut water, I think. And I designed a logo for them and didn't hear from them for like a while. And then one day after this all had happened, like a year and a half later, they came back and they said, we know we want to do something. We have this concept, but knew we wanted a seltzer. At the time, that was just all over. That was White Claw, you know, dominating the market, truly starting um, and everything kind of exploding. So we knew people liked seltzer and we knew that we wanted it to enhance the experience of drinking. We saw in the market there wasn't any, there were things that mimicked alcohol, like spiritless spirits, <laughs> like 
not the actual brand, but that is an actual brand. <laughs> also like de-alcoholized wine, NA beers, but no one was really like bringing anything to the table in our minds in terms of health benefit and mm -hmm. why people drink in the first place, which is the feeling. So we kind of noticed that like there's this opportunity to like blend your health with socializing and not have it have to be a choice. And at the time, through this kind of like conceptual process, Evan was going to business school, which was a massive help just for the amount of time that he could dedicate to the brand and the business itself on actually making it numerically work and statistically and, you know, across the board, proving it out to investors. While, you know, George focused on like the sales of how we were even going to set up the brand from an online perspective, from an in-source perspective. And I was like at the time working at Endeavor, you know, a nine to five, but more like a eight to eight. And yeah. um, that was a lot. But at night, I would literally like get off calls and go on to calls with George and Evan. Um, and Evan was working on it pretty much full time. George was back and forth between his job and helping Evan wherever he could. Um, and eventually after, after I think his first year or maybe during his second year, um, we entered the concept into a, um, UCLA Anderson, it was the Nat Venture competition. So they have like a incubator that hosts these things that investors come to and, you know, prominent figures of the school will attend. And I, it was like November of 2020, maybe. Uh, like right before the pandemic, I think. And we had had a couple things built. We had had our first formula, but that one still had terpenes, I think. Um, and Evan and George pitched it and they ended up winning it. So that was our first grant that we won to actually like take it from, this isn't a, an idea that we have that's like really cool and exciting to, oh, this is like a business we're going to run. Um, so Evan used that money to actually fund the first formulation and the first, you know, investments in product, um, for HIO. And we went back to the drawing board a little bit while we were raising our first round of investment investment. And we looked at our ingredients, looked at the drinking experience of our first kind of test batches and kind of entirely reformulated. Oh. Um, we took out the terpenes because we learned there was just a lot of discomfort around them still in the industry. We were looking at functionals that basically did the same thing or, or helped helped simulate the same feeling um, of of a, a feeling that you'd have while you were drinking. So like, why do why do we do it? Um, we want to relax. We want to have fun. We want to be more talkative and, you know, more free with our emotion. Like there are a handful of ways that I think people use alcohol to unwind, I guess, in air quotes. Um, but we wanted to like create that, but from healthy functional ingredients. And there are so many supplements and new things now in the health world that help people do that, that grow from the earth and are FDA approved and totally good for you and you can work them into your diet, doctor recommended. So we looked at the ones that are more widely used, that are most natural, highest quality, um, and basically, yeah, got to work over, you know, we worked with a medicinal herbalist um, who kind of helped us like choose those ingredients. Um, and that was a connection I think Evan made through UCLA and business school. But he basically set our first kind of six functional ingredients. And then from there, we went to the drawing table with flavors. And we literally sat in a room at a table much like this and um, took little sips of little cups for like many hours wow. and talked about flavors and combos and what would work together and what would work separate and what people would like. Um, and that turned into this <laughs> somehow. Wow. Um, we ended up launching last year, um, it, or not last, oh my God, it's 2023, I hate this. <laughs> uh, sorry, we launched um, last, two years ago now, um, in 2021. Okay. But we started working on this whole thing, like 2019, 2020, um, and then have now since been in business for a year and a half, a little over. And ever since, it's like we hopped on a bullet train and we don't plan on getting off. Um, but it's just, yeah, it's the non-alc market has exploded. Um, tons of celebrities are hopping on board. There's more audience than I've ever seen on social reacting to things. Um, it's good to see. But yeah, it's just right now, it's such a new space. It's such a new market and we're a new product. So the more that we can tell people and share the story and educate about it and the occasion, um, 
that's what we're here for. That's amazing. That was so long, by the way, but sorry. (laughs) No, it's great. (laughs) So much background. I love it. Did you guys start with only one flavor? Did you, like, when you launched, were there multiple flavors? We started with three. um, And basically the thinking behind that was, and Evan has explained this before, which is why I have it fresh in my mind. Um, But basically one can, or one flavor essentially is like, that's all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. So if you go to a market with one flavor, then, you know, it's pretty much all or nothing. Um, so we knew we wanted to have a selection. Um, two is nice, but usually there's like a favorite picked and then it makes it hard to have like one flavor that doesn't outdo each other. And to have like just a straight complimentary set is also just, it's still like too few. So we thought three was a nice in between um, in terms of just, overall selection and variety and then also like still keeping it narrow and focused um also from a packing and shipping perspective uh cans are packed by six pack and derivatives of that so or not derivatives but multiples of that so um we basically had we i've now learned that we have to be in certain multiples of things to launch new flavors in order to ship and pack effectively got it What's the order of like the ones, like how it was made and when you decided like, oh, I'm going to do peach mango. and Yeah. Um, so we started initially, our first ever blends were actually something that Evan and George picked. Um, and they were like very, they were honestly, I think like the options on the shelf at the formulator of just a first ever blend. And I think we had berry mango and citrus, which were mm-hmm. like very, I remember they came over with like the drinks and I was like, this is what we're calling them. And they're like, well, that's our flavor, but like we can come up with more creative names. And I was like, we need cooler fruits. Um, <laughs> so we sat down and those first ones, we all just loved mango. And I think that's like a new flavor that's come on the board, like next to traditional like strawberry and mm-hmm. orange that like people just love. So we all just kind of loved that one. Um, the other two in our first formulation were actually more similar to like the cocktail atmosphere so we did a ginger lime one which was based on like a mule Um, and then we had a more like floral herbaceous one that was lemon lavender quickly learned in our first after like our first investor round that we shipped out our that first test tube that like people liked mango they did not like lemon lavender and like ginger lime was kind of in the middle um and so when we got that feedback and like drank the drink ourselves I think we all kind of realized like we want to do something that we launched with three flavors that we are like 100% behind and none of us really were behind any of them fully. So we reformulated and this time we came at it with a more, with a less cocktail vibe and a more like, what do we want the vibe of this drink to be? Mm -hmm. Um, And for us, it was like, we want this drink at the beach. We want it on the weekend. We want it kicking back on the couch. Like we want it to be refreshing and enjoyable and not fussy and not, you know, potentially taste weird to some people. So we thought like large scale, you know, familiar, but at the same time, combinations that were still somewhat unique. We kind of just started playing with flavors. We considered doing, you know, either one flavor or like blends of two. We liked the blends idea more. And then we decided to pick like a sweeter fruit and a citrus fruit to kind of balance each other out in each profile. Um, and then it was, yeah, like we, I think we did like peach pineapple, mango pineapple, mango peach. Like we did all different things for a lot of different little sippy cups until we got to three that we were really, really, really happy with. Love it. Amazing. I'm curious. You just mentioned like how you guys decide let's do what we actually want. Do you think that's a reason of like your success as you guys create a brand about what you wanted versus like what does everyone else want or what does the market want to see? Yes. I think that's something I think about often, honestly. Um, And I think there is totally an argument for creating for your audience. Like, that's definitely not what I'm trying to say. But I think there was, at least for me and how I creatively have started to take on this role, it was like the moment that I stopped, (laughs) and this sounds so freaking cliche, (laughs) but like the moment that I stopped listening to what other people wanted me to do creatively, and part of that was just starting my own company, like getting out of a corporate structure and doing something where literally no one was (laughs) managing me, but also just like starting to really have no guidelines. Like we were a startup, so there was 
no framework to work within. And I think a lot of times these days, established brands have been around so long that they just start focusing on their audience as their core brand personality when it's like, no, your audience wants to see like who you are behind that. And when I realized that and like just by way of Evan and George letting me do what I did best and letting me design the cans and, you know, concept kind of creatively as I wanted, um, I did that. Like I didn't have anyone really giving me any sort of tip or direction. And it ended up, I think, going in our favor just because I know at the end of the day, like it's if anything, I can say it's what I wanted. <laughs> mm-hmm. And like, if I'm going to put my name on a product and behind myself, I didn't make it for someone else. Like we, yes, we are making it to change the way the world drinks and are making it for other people to enjoy. But like at the end of the day, this is the life we wanted to create for ourselves. This yeah. was the life that Evan and George saw that white space. That's the, what they lived in sobriety, which a lot of people now don't. That's just not a lifestyle that people partake in and if it is it's stigmatized Mm -hmm. so it was one of those things where it was like no we have this idea and this product that we really think is needed because we've lived this ourselves and we're just showing that to everybody else because I think in my mind you need to instead of trying to sell someone on something or at like tell someone why they need it I think it's so much more convincing to just show it and to lead by example, I guess where that, (laughs) that's where this all is going is that like you have to live the lifestyle of your brand and of the brand you're trying to create. Yeah. Would you say that's how you were able to raise money? Was that like your pitch? Like this is what we want to do? Do you support us or not? Um, I think the mission and the storytelling part of just where it all came from, like everything I just said about why or like how Evan and George even realized this was a white space was from personal experience. So I think that definitely like plays a role and adds to the credibility of why we all want to do it and seeing them go through that as a friend and watching them try to figure out how to solve it. It was like something for me that was just like totally endearing, like Mm -hmm. watching these two guys go through this shared experience and be like, no, but how do we make the world better is something that I think was a really good like it's not an angle but like it was a good way to look at it yeah and that was a huge part of it was the mission and the people behind it and we've always wanted people to know who we were and I think the other half of it was they were early to this industry like they started working on this in 2019 and like it's only now becoming you know popular enough for a big retail across you know the U.S. it's only just now getting on shelves and Whole Foods and you know, Ralph's and hy and things like that all across the U.S. And in terms of beverage, and I had no idea about this, like before I started working, I used to work in entertainment too. So I was like in a very different sphere, but like beverage, like big retail is where you make it. Like those huge box stores are like your God tier. That's where you want to be. But those are the ones that feel the least personal. Yeah. They're the ones that feel the least small town mom and pop. Let Like it's just boxes in a warehouse. Um, but at the same time, that's how you get it to the entire freaking, like, you know, country. So, um, I think it was trying to balance how to keep it accessible and how to keep it not totally focused on like just us, but like showing people the lifestyle that we enjoy is some of the best marketing we can do for ourselves, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. And what does the average day in the life look like? for you currently (laughs) i'm sure it's different (laughs) every day but oh my gosh i actually this is really funny um i just filmed a this is a perfect marketing pitch for our tiktok account (laughs) (laughs) please don't let it be um no we're still building it but i just filmed a day in the life actually so i'll walk you through what was last Thursday. So I woke up in the morning. I usually wake up right now. We have an office in Venice, but it's shared. So it's like three of us in one room because we're scrappy and a young company. And so we kind of share that. I usually start the day at home and then we'll go in kind of as needed. But that morning I started with like probably two to three hours of checking emails and calls. Usually those are like first thing when my mind is fresh in the day, at least into lunchtime. So that's like the first half of my day. But then that day, it was right after the holiday and we had investor note cards to get out. So 
we over Christmas had like done an entire run of like custom holiday cards that are they look like a family holiday card and um, I personally volunteered for some reason to write all of them oh my god because I thought it would be personal and important which it was and I will die on that hill but I wrote all of them and I had to address all of them and stamp all of them and take all of them to the post office (laughs) but then I when I went to the post office we had two events that night that needed like events and signage material so I ran and I got some frames and did some printouts of menus for our like actual on-site presentation Um, and then that was like my afternoon and then my night was a sampling um, for a book launch at one of our retailers in LA on Lincoln it's called the new bar it's actually really cool it's like a little non-alcoholic bar slash bottle shop we went poured up there then after an hour and a half of that hopped over to Winston House, um, which we're doing a month-long activation with for their, it's their Out of the Blue series. So it's like 30 new artists in 30 days. um, And we're sponsoring it for the non-ALK occasion. um, And then went to that, saw two incredible musicians, actually. um, Sam Fisher, who recently got very famous off Mm -hmm. of TikTok. And I was listening and I was like, oh, he's that guy. Um, (laughs) And then he said, yeah, by the way, I'm that guy. And I was like, wow. (laughs) Um, but we saw him and um and then had to leave that to go make a literal midnight run of a christmas gift for this is where i have to be careful um an exciting partnership that is in the works in music and entertainment um so we were delivering a half pallet of hio (laughs) somewhere and that involved evan driving us a long ways with a trunk full of Hio and me wrapping it with a very large bow like you see in the car commercials and writing a handheld note. Um, And then we were driving home and I think it was like 11.57 p.m. So like that was my whole day. But that was a fun one. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, that's like honestly, it's a smattering. It's some days are emails and calls. Other days I'm in storage, sorting through merchandise. <laughs> Some days I'm just designing e- emails and materials and decks all day. Like it can be anything and it's focused in for me, brand and design and creative, but for all of us, we wear a lot of hats. Do you enjoy like not knowing what tomorrow holds? Kind of. Yeah. I used to, I feel like I used to like the structure. Like I always used to have this conversation with my fiance where we were talking and he he started his own business very young and was always like very entrepreneurial minded and was like very confident about that. And for me, I liked the structure of corporate. Mm -hmm. And so it was something that like, now it feels like freeing kind of, I guess. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. I love to know like, what's your, what's your marketing strategy? Just because I feel like there's a million brands Mm-hmm. Now, like, if I go to Air One, I can't even, like, count how many beverage brands are there. And it's like, <laughs> what what, what do you think you guys have done that's really made you stand out um, from the crowd? I was just talking to Evan about this this morning. Um, but what we're starting to see, and this is kind of something from the beginning, that because it's a new category and because it's taking on such an established one, it's, like, very hard to not only, like, educate on what your product is, and why people need it, but then also like fight a behemoth of like beer and alcohol and wine and spirits. And um, I think we kind of tried to like take it on in a way that was more, I don't know, like personal. And um, it was it like back to what we were saying kind of about like the storytelling and like showing the lifestyle is like we wanted – we wanted it to be more than a drink and more than just like, this is a can that we're asking you to buy. We wanted it to be an experience, to be an occasion, and to like mean something larger to that person. And so um, that's where across the industry, we we saw non-ALK was only really trending in like the mimic category of, you know, the, yeah, the spiritless rums or, you know, the different types of de-alcoholized whatever. Um, but no one was really focusing on like the functional benefit. And there were very few companies at the time, like only a few other of our competitors were even around. 
and they were all still figuring out like what even these ingredients meant to the marketplace, what adaptogens and nootropics, you know, as marketing points, could, like if they even meant anything. Yeah. Um, and I think what we've learned is that a lot of, I think what separates us is that lifestyle and that like <laughs> what we've shown it can be. Because like you said, like there are so many options on every shelf nowadays mm -hmm. on Air One, on, you know, mass retailers, on Costco. Like there is just a billion drinks that anyone could pick up. So it's like not only are you competing amongst just like non-alcohol alternatives and alcohol, it's also, you know, they could drink anything else. Yeah. They can drink water. They can drink lemonade. They can drink coffee. And so it's like what really separated us was like we – focused on an occasion we focused specifically on you know like post 5 p.m unwinding whatever that means whether it's at home or out but like something to unwind with that makes you feel good it relieves your stress it boosts your mood and it makes you truly enjoy just being present more um and we we also, I haven't said this yet, which was impressive for how long we've been talking. Um, we kind of, the feeling that we kind of have been getting at, um, which is hard to like define because there's also like legalities of ways that you can talk about a product and things that you can say in terms of what it does and like what you claim it does. We basically, we call it the float. So it was actually a term that was created, I think, in like one of our investor talks. Like someone somewhere had said it made them feel floaty. We were like, ooh. That's a, that's a nice one. That was kind of the the feeling that we leaned into in terms of the product benefits, health benefits that it offers. And so like that kind of relieved, you know, stress, the boosted mood, the increased presence, the enhanced focus, like that hint of natural energy, but still feeling relaxed. Um, we wanted all of those things kind of encapsulated and we got lucky with a blend of ingredients that luckily is that and does that um, for a lot of people. And it kind of, I think, showed us that like people want that experience. They don't just want a pretty cocktail glass and a, you know, twist of whatever um, and like a overpriced mocktail. Like yeah. they want something in their drink that will like make them feel something or help them be healthier or, yeah. you know, have better intention. Um, and so far that's, I think, what's connected the most with people and what set us apart. Nice. What are some of the biggest challenges you faced marketing wise? Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> wow. I think in terms, to the contrary, I'll play my own devil's advocate here, um, that the float was also one of the hardest things to try and define because in terms of like any added ingredient in the functional space, like to claim that it does something to someone is like you're betting on very risky odds there because it's their health. They could be on any type of things for their own health. You know, depending on what their own body needs, they'll react differently. So we have to be careful with it. And that's where like when we were first starting, not having any experience <laughs> as beverage formulators or as, you know, beverage marketers even of knowing like what we could and could not say. And so trying to define it when you like, don't really know what you can say was really difficult because it's like, well, then how do we describe it? And so we ended up relying more on like the common effects terms of our ingredients that we have in there and, you know, common side effects. And that's what we say is, you know, it can do these things and we're intentional about the way that we word it because yeah. we don't want to guarantee an experience, but, you know, backed by scientific research, a lot of these ingredients do these things. Um, and so, I think just figuring out how to navigate that and how to explain that to a customer is difficult. Yeah, they're just, they're, they're uncommon ingredients. So like, I think that's another thing is just as a beverage in a new industry with newer ingredients that other than like health nut slash maybe a lot of LA people, but other than like the, you know, the coastal cities, um, a lot of America doesn't know about these ingredients yeah. yet. Like they don't take them. They're not part of their daily routine, but they also know that they do love their seltzer and, you know, they like good beverages and, you know, there are things that we're seeing kind of catch on throughout the U.S. So it's, yeah, I think overall just communicating that feeling and that experience and what the beverage actually is and how it helps you get there has been just like 
the hardest, but like still, I think most rewarding process. Yeah. What is your target audience that you guys are marketing towards? Um, <laughs> we call ourselves a cool mom brand um, okay. because we've found in the past couple of years, um, just with like our advertising, um, we resonate really well with women between 25 and 45. Um, we're focused on like larger metropolitan cities, but kind of everywhere, like we just see it across the board. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's like suburban young moms or, you know, metropolitan young moms or young career women who are still in that, like, keep up with it lifestyle, whether it's with kids or with friends or with work. And they want something in the social occasion. They want something to unwind. They want something at the end of the night. And they're usually reaching for wine or they're reaching for a cocktail and they're like totally tired of waking up hungover. Mm. And so we've seen, we luckily found a great kind of like market fit with that audience. But even now, like we see it going and, you know, there's tons of other channels too. Like in terms of like target audience, I think about that and I'm like, yes, we know we have to define one and it's like good to have one. But at the same time, one of the pieces of feedback from, um, one of the uh, beverage awards that we were in that we entered um, was that we were like thinking too small about our audience. And they were like, this drink could apply to more people. Um, and so we started thinking, you know, differently. There's been tons of talk around sober communities and like helping destigmatize that space in terms of not drinking. And, you know, even if you have a history with alcohol, like why does that matter if mm -hmm. you're trying to now not? Um, and so, there's been, you know, talk of not only the sobriety, you know, marketplace, but um, an audience, but um, also health space. Like we bridge the gap between a health beverage and a social beverage. So it's kind of we can go in that traditional like socializing occasion. But luckily, because we have so many functionals in our drink, we can also go in the health drink like if you want to drink us because we have ashwagandha and l-theanine and you like those in your supplement regimen 100 percent, you go and sip us every day um so we can kind of depending on the occasion or depending on the person fit into different parts of their lifestyle and i think that helps us out a lot what do you think the challenge has been about like targeting males and how do you like have you changed your strategy since it was focused mainly towards like women or they were the target market? And now if you're thinking bigger, I think, yeah, I think with males, it's just overall and like, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is something I've heard is that like overall in terms of social engagement, like males are proven to not interact as much and not really like engage as much with advertising or online content like females just use their phones in those ways more to like buy things especially with like a d2c product so just by way of like audiences like the overall social audience i would guess is a little more predominantly female and then i think with us it males like it i don't i've never seen us as focused on particularly either like yes we figured out that you know, the cool moms liked us, but that was more of like, a, okay, this is great. Now we know that we have these people, like we can create for them, but like it's always kind of been a more overarching direction for me. And um, I think that's part of like what I also try to do and what I noticed like about a lot of other brands content was that a lot of the seltzers felt very feminine and they felt very like, bubbly and <laughs> light and like elegant and while yes like our cans are very colorful I'd like to think at the same time they're simple enough to if a guy was carrying them yeah. it wouldn't look overtly feminine um but yeah it is it's kind of just I could talk about like positioning and how many little elements I think tie into each kind of gender but at the end of the day we were trying to be genderless like we we're yeah. we're trying to be as inclusive as possible honestly um in terms of whether you're male or female or healthy or not Comes or across. a drinker or not a drinker like it was kind of something that we wanted it to be able to compete on that very colorful shelf that you were talking about yeah. but at the same time yeah not specifically be focused on anyone signy all of the cans are so beautiful and have different color hues where, where did they come from and the inspiration for the design behind all the different flavors 
Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the cans are actually inspired by sunsets. Um, when I was going through and kind of creative concepting for some of our like brand pillars, one of them was that we were like a SoCal based brand. We wanted to feel like Southern California because um, that's where we were made. And so um, I was doing a lot of research and a lot of Southern California photos are nice sunsets. Um, and I just fell in love with the colors and the saturation and kind of looking at them. So I ended up then kind of figuring out color profiles that would work in the sunsets for our flavors um, and ended up with three different photos from three different beaches in California um, that then I used to actually add the colors. And if you look on the can, there's like a little fun Easter eggy, um, but there are coordinates on the front face of every can. They're really tiny on the left, um, but that goes to a beach in California. So I think Malibu is watermelon lime and Santa Monica is peach mango and blackberry lemon is La Jolla Cove. But um, yeah, they're all kind of, they're based on life at the beach, both visually and physically. <laughs> Amazing. When you showed that to the team, were they answering like, yes, this is it? Kind of, yeah. I mean, in my own mind, honestly, the night I had this like idea of, I remember it still. And I like remember the file that I was working in because like when I finally started putting the colors together and like finding the photos I liked I was like oh shit this is cool <laughs> um and then I explained it to them and they were like yeah this is like the dopest idea but I think it's kind of because I was most <laughs> excited about the idea um but luckily yeah it's something that we do hear about and like I'm really grateful to be able to hear from people that like compliment our packaging because yeah it's really yeah. good yeah it's it's just those are like the warm fuzzies of having a brand that I'm like I love it <laughs> Nice. Amazing. Where did the name Hayo come from? Ooh, um, that's a great one. Uh, so Hayo actually came from an Excel spreadsheet <laughs> that <laughs> we spent a lot of time working on. Um, when Evan entered the concept into the competition that he won, um, it was actually named Willow. So that's like a pre Hayo little fun fact um, is at one point the concept was called Willow. And that was the like terpene kind of one. So mm -hmm. when we reformulated, we kind of like across the board were like, we're changing this whole perspective. It's going to be a lot less health focused, much more social occasion focused. Um, so we were honestly like, this is how I remember it. It might be different to George and Evan, but we had had an Excel spreadsheet and we were, we went in and made columns for ourselves and we gave each other 10 cells and literally wrote down like our top like fun names of just ideas that we had. And George is a really good writer and also a poet. So comes up with like great little phrases and sayings and everything. Mm -hmm. And I think he had written happy in your own, which was like, a, you know, for being like comfortable in your own skin, just like happy in your own. And we abbreviated it and it was H-I-Y-O. And then we were like, oh, that's cool. That's also like hi and yo, which is like two greetings and like a social occasion. And we were like, it's an acronym and like it stands for what we are. And so then HIO was born and it was <laughs> wow. like this Excel spreadsheet that looked like a math equation, but was really just us, yeah, talking about, I think we wrote down like what started it was we just wrote down words. It was like the 10 cells were like for like the words or like sayings or anything that you liked. And we all had some good ideas and picked like our top three of each and everyone just loved George the happy in your own concept from like the second that we talked about it as a group and then it just ended up working out really well that's great i love yeah that. i'm curious for creative wise do you just do all of it internally or do you work with like freelance creative partners um we work with partners i cannot take claim for all of the creative work we do um for like in terms of i would say like the corporate branding side like the packaging and the website and things like that I do design all of that we work with like implementation partners so like I have someone that builds the website or develops it um but I myself overall from a design perspective had to have designed most of that um where the partners come in is largely content um so with like photo and video um we have a great partnership I know I mentioned with Winston House um they have a wonderful creative director named Tom, who is a photographer by trade um, that I very luckily get to work with, very complimentary, because I think more like design, brand, packaging, print material world, and he thinks like photo, video, fun, you know, moving image world. Um, and so he and I have quarterly photo shoots that we do. Um, 
that we try to make into just really fun like friend moments and invite all our people to come nice. <laughs> drink Kayo and get their photo taken. Um, but then we also, yeah, we work with like a variety of partners that help us implement. Um, we have like an email marketing team um, that has a designer that helps me out on like promotional and like flow emails. Um, but in terms of like most things, like I do all of our social, I we have a girl who helps us on our TikTok. Um, yet another plug, <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, but yeah, we have we have like smaller partners here and there, but no like huge brand agency partners or anything like that. Like yeah. all very close local friend groups and people that we really like working with. And is the full team currently just the three of you still? The three of you co-founders? We have four now. There's four of you. Okay, we four. did. We made a hire at the end of 2022. Um, he is our director of online growth. So um, his name's Cooper, and he is our first official employee, um, wow. in addition to the co-founders. Um, and he's kind of like our wizard behind everything e-com and like D2C online, which is very helpful for a brand that does a lot of their business online. So most of your business is online, but you're also in stores. Yes. Um, yeah. Untraditionally to a lot of other beverage brands, um, we are actually like primarily online, which oh. um, was another kind of thing I think that sets us apart too when you ask about like what makes us different is that a lot of brands try to break into the marketplace by going to retail first. And that's a really big beast to take on. That's a really big thing to just launch out there with if you don't know who your audience is. Um, so we started D2C just to find our audience, just to know that people cared, that people wanted it, who they were, when they wanted it, why they wanted it. Um, and luckily we found that quickly with the moms and with you know Southern California and the coastal cities. Um, and from there kind of tried to build it out. But yeah, it's been kind of a long time coming, I guess. <laughs> what are your most popular cities where people are buying high yo from? Um, right now our core markets are in Los Angeles, Austin, Chicago, and New York. Um, so again, yeah, the bigger metropolitan cities. We're kind of, we're seeing it pop up all over, um, which is really cool. Like I was just, for those like holiday cards, um, we did like a list of our top 70, or we had like a top 100 customers. And I was actually going through the addresses and like there were orders from like Montana and Ohio and like Georgia and North Carolina and Connecticut. And I was like, holy shit, um, this is, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> no, but I was like, this is, it, it, we have these core markets that are larger cities where we are carried in retail. Um, but yeah, we luckily, because we've been online, we've kind of, had this audience across the US, but trying to now go into retail, you know, now that we have this audience, we are for focusing on, you know, places 